It's November 2018, and James Cordier, CEO of OptionSellers.com, uploads a video to YouTube that begins as follows. Needless to say, the events of this past week have been incredibly devastating for our clients. That's what a man sounds like when he's not only lost all of his clients' money, but had margined their accounts so dramatically that they are now in debt. It's an echo of an event that happened 12 years prior. In 2006, Amaranth Advisors was one of the hottest funds on Wall Street. Then suddenly, it was in ruins. This time, it was a 32-year-old trader named Brian Hunter who had done the damage. What do these two incidents have in common? In both cases, the funds were done in because they dared to participate in a trade known as the Widowmaker. Okay, so most specifically, the Widowmaker moniker is used to describe a spread on natural gas futures, specifically having to do with the difference between pricing for March and April contracts. But to keep things simple, just think of it as natural gas in general. What makes the trade so dangerous? Well, the pricing of a commodity is based on supply and demand. And in many cases, these are susceptible to kind of random events. Think of how lumber prices were impacted by the COVID pandemic lockdowns where everyone decided to do home improvement projects all at once. And then another thing to worry about is weather. Take, for example, James Cordier's description of his best trade ever from decades before his fall from grace. He said, the most memorable trade has to be long the coffee market in 1994. Forecasts called for a very cold winter for the southern growing regions of Brazil. Sure enough, freezing temperatures invaded coffee fields not once, but twice that year, and prices tripled in a very short period of time. Despite his success with spiking prices, Cordier's strategy at OptionSellers.com was a bet that those spikes would always be survivable. The company would sell puts and calls on a variety of commodities, with the idea being that prices for the most part would stay between the prices that he'd selected. This sort of strategy is sometimes described as picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. It works most of the time, but then once the steamroll actually hits you, it probably didn't end up being worth it to pick up all those pennies anyways, because you end up flattened or in this case, posting a home-age hostage video of yourself on YouTube. Brian Hunter, on the other hand, lived for these spikes. At Amaranth Advisors, he had made the firm a billion dollars in 2005, personally receiving a payout in the neighborhood of $100 million after the consecutive hurricanes of Katrina and Rita decimated U.S. supplies heading into winter. For 2006, he positioned himself similarly, the La Nina atmospheric system had formed in the Pacific, which increases the conditions that are normally the cause of bad Atlantic storms. Fear of a repeat of 2005 drove the market up, and Amaranth was up big by that spring. And then, nothing happened. There were no major hurricanes, and even worse, natural gas producers who had feared these storms had massively built up their reserves. Supply was through the roof. Plus, as a final blow, predictions started coming in that the winter was going to be tamer than normal. The result of all this is that the price of natural gas started to fall. And just like that, Hunter and Amaranth were trapped. See, Brian Hunter wasn't just a natural gas trader. He was one of the largest traders in the country. His positions at times would grow to represent close to half of all contracts for natural gas in a given month. This meant that he couldn't just sell and take his losses and move on. If he started to sell into an already weak market, 
he would tank the price, ensuring that each contract that he sold off, he'd be able to get less for than the one that had sold before it. So being stuck in this position, he had a tough choice. He could eat that big loss that he was facing, or he could double down, buy from everyone else who was giving up on their positions so that the price would be supported at least for a while and hope to be rescued by the act of a vengeful God sending a hurricane to destroy the Gulf Coast. So that was what he did. And then when no cold snap came or hurricane, the position was big enough to sink the entire firm, which, by the way, had billed itself as a multi-strategy firm rather than just an energy trading operation, meaning Hunter really only should have made up a fraction of the total gains or losses. But when the guy who made you a billion dollars the year before tells you he wants to start making some bigger bets, it's probably pretty hard to tell him no. The result was over six billion in losses. The gigantic positions that would have wrecked the market ended up being sold basically in bulk to hedge fund apex predators like Citadel, who ultimately ended up profiting massively thanks to being able to buy at distressed prices. Sometimes in investing, you feel like you're a genius. This is what I thought probably happened in these cases. James Cordier had had great success in commodities for a long time, and then one day, the big one came. He claimed he was always on the lookout for it, but until it hits you, it just feels like something that happens to other people. But here's the thing. Brian Hunter had a history. He worked as an energy trader at Deutsche Bank in the early 2000s. He racked up tens of millions of profits for the company, and then in 2003, he lost 50 million in a single week, had his trading privileges revoked, and ended up suing the company who was refusing to pay him his bonus. Then Amaranth hired him anyways. Maybe they'd never heard the saying, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Or worse, they believe the oldest lie on Wall Street. This time it's different. Thanks for watching, guys.